Welcome back, everybody, to our closing keynote session. Um, it's certainly been an exciting and thought-provoking day. Uh, we've had wonderful sessions that have covered topics across the health information spectrum. So we've heard about new research, the importance of making content accessible, explorations in teaching, health literacy, translating knowledge into mediums that promote understanding of health information, and so much more. So I really hope you leave today's symposium brimming with new ideas and ready to go home and discuss and maybe implement some things at your home institutions. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our final speaker for today, Ms. Tina Purnett. Ms. Purnett is team lead for infodemic management in the unit for high impact events preparedness, Department of Infectious Hazards Management Division for Emergency Preparedness at the WHO. Tina's worked in, at the intersection of health research, analysis, and policymaking with an emphasis on digital health and health information systems. Previously, she worked at WHO on frameworks for assessment and evaluation of AI and other digital health technologies within healthcare. She's also worked on health information exchange and interoperability and related aspects of health data governance for sharing research and use in policymaking. And I think she's the perfect person to close out our symposium today. So thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. And the floor is yours, Tina. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> Uh, I've actually been following some of the conversations, uh, 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 listening or, or following the conversations uh, uh, on social media. And um, actually, uh, I, I will really add, to, hopefully, today perspective from, uh, from an epidemic management point of view. And I'll explain what I mean later. But uh, I actually think that everything that you've summarized now and what I've been following in the conversations from today, uh, you, you all are epidemic managers as WHO um, uh, seeks out also new ways of how we, how we manage, uh, encourage healthy behaviors um, uh, during an emergency, but also <laughs> outside of it. So I'm gonna share my screen. I did prepare some slides, but I hope it will not be that by PowerPoint for you. And um, we, can, uh, we can start. I look forward to our discussion as well. So, um, the first point I'd like to make, I'd like to start the talk by basically uh, describing that really our working environment is changing. I think you feel this too, uh, and it's reflected in your discussions. Um, so, you know, from for over the last 22 months or so, we've all worked and lived through a total society event, and we still are living in it. And it's been um, the first time when public health practitioners and as people we've been faced by um, the full impact of how much technology progress has changed, how we connect um, uh, with each other, how we make decisions, how we enact health behaviors and how we influence each other, both in personal and professional uh, spheres. So in effect, we're experiencing uh, or we've experienced an amplification and spread of information of all kinds including concerns and questions and rumors and misinformation and information of varying quality. And at WHO, we described this phenomenon as an infodemic. So, you know, when you combine this surge of information with an emergency and uncertainty, it, it's then <coughs> harder for people to find reliable information that they could then uh, help them make informed decisions uh, to protect their health and their community. So this is very much related to the previous panel. Uh, so we've really seen uh, real harm over the last year from people ingesting methanol because they thought it would help their bodies get rid of the virus, or in many places around the world, people have used herbal remedies or even medications that were unproven, like ivermectin, to help treat COVID-19. And even from outbreaks before COVID-19, we've learned that the infodemic doesn't only have a direct impact on health, or cause just, just merely confusion. Importantly, it also exacerbates mistrust in science and in health authorities and in public health measures. And it even reduces acceptance uh, of, of vaccines and treatments. So um, in addition to that, it also has wider societal impacts, such as uh, increased stigma and loosening of social cohesion. So all of this makes it harder for um, uh, and this is from the perspective of health authorities, for health authorities to manage the, the pandemic and also to manage the epidemic risk. 
but uh, obviously there's other effects across society uh, that uh, all of the institutions and communities are grappling with. So in the protracted pandemic, responders and health systems are now exhausted and people have faced adversity from loosening of social cohesion and threats to their livelihoods. So now in, November, in December, <laughs> 2021, um, the COVID-19 infodemic is blending with the COVID-19 vaccine infodemic, with the influenza infodemic, with and with wider political and societal challenges that we're facing. Uh, health system is overloaded, and for example, for immunization programs, the work is actually intensifying. So health policymakers are now uh, discussing how to build back better after such a total society event. Uh, just this week, they kicked off um, negotiations for a pandemic preparedness treaty. So there really is a recognition that we need to understand and support preparedness for emergencies and resilience <coughs> of health systems and communities. And I would argue that we need to think about how this can be done with awareness or how the digitized society and the digital information ecosystem interplay with people's behavior and public health. And I see libraries uh, as, as a key mediator of that. And I'll explain this a bit later. Um, in public health, we're faced with a demand that our epidemic management tools need to be more effective. And they can be more effective if we recognize that societal dynamics influence how our public health system works, how people experience our work and how we ourselves work. Uh, now, of course, the health system alone cannot solve societal problems um, and we certainly cannot solve the infodemic through the health system alone, but it is our responsibility as practitioners to think about what is in the domain of influence uh, of our institutions. So health authorities, libraries, other partners um, and what can be changed so that we can promote the better uptake of epidemic mitigation measures by people, by vulnerable communities and, and by society. So the infodemic is a global phenomenon, but to reduce its harmful effect <clears throat> and to increase effectiveness of epidemic management measures, well, we need everyone involved. And uh, how we actually are going to get out of the pandemic well through collective action. When enough people change their behavior to follow public health guidance. So, what the infodemic challenges is behaviors and how people are acting. Do they adhere to public health guidance? Are they taking up vaccines and uh, recommended treatments? So this phenomenon is really complex. And this also means that reducing the harm uh, from the infodemic is difficult. It's also very difficult to create an environment that supports healthy behaviors. So we really do need all of the parts of the health system involved. We need all of the parts of society to get involved and we also need to manage it across multiple levels and communities from local to global. <coughs> so um, if we really want to be effective responding within this complexity, then our response needs to be nuanced. We need to think how health professionals uh, are at the interface between the health systems and populations. Um, so we also need to think about how the changes in society are pressuring us to consider the way that we work in public health. So public health is experiencing the same uh, uh, pressure that you've been discussing um, uh, uh, from the li library perspective. So I will first describe in my talk the societal problem, the challenge of the information ecosystem and the health information and, and of, of people. And I will conclude with some reflections that very likely will not be new to you. Uh, but I would like to bring into conversation today the perspective of health policymaker and of the health system and of evidence-based tools. And I would argue actually that um, responding to the infodemic is so multidimensional that we need to think about it as a new public health threat that has emerged through the changes in societal dynamics and lifestyles. This was just like non-communicable diseases, for example. So to respond to it, we need an integrated approach and it needs to be focused on individuals, but grounded in the commitment for health and well-being of all people. So then, you know, the question for me is how do we adapt public health policy and actions across society? What kind of partnerships we need to have, how we can think differently so that we from all entry points 
we can tackle the harm from the infodemic. So uh, first, <coughs> first, what I'd like to discuss is that actually during the pandemic, we've, we've actually experienced a perfect storm. Uh, and this uh, perfect storm makes it hard to encourage healthy behaviors in the population. And we can think through it in sort of three layers. Um, in the first layer, uh, we have a global pandemic that is changing by the minute in terms of its effects and what we know about it. And it's transpiring differently in different parts of the world, but it is being largely understood through the internet. So we have health authorities like the WHO and other organizations whose mandate is that they communicate about what we know and what we don't know about the pandemic. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the same time, we know that the local television and local internet coverage would be topping up this information for people in specific locales and telling them what they should be taking on board in, in their location. But the problem is that the global flows of information move faster than the local response. So you could be living in Pakistan and find out what the US CDC thinks uh, about COVID-19 before you know what the health authority in Lahore think you should be doing. In the second layer is that we also need to understand the historical trajectory of this particular virus uh, and disease. Uh, they've, they've lent themselves to a lot of country against country narratives and the geopolitical dimension. So conversations and narratives that have been, uh, have been changing actually, depending on what month and what year we're in. For example, things uh, like whether it's the Wuhan virus or the Indian or South African variant. And this is why things like uh, in, insisting um, on correct nomenclature for using terms like COVID-19 and Delta or Omicron variants is really important because this is not just linguistic splitting hairs. It's making it clear that we need to separate out scientific information that can save people's lives. And we separate that from stories and rumors about neighbors who are we're in struggle with <coughs> and stories that, <coughs> excuse me, and stories that sell media. And then there's the third layer um, that's important, uh, I think, also to think about uh, as much as possible about, about the distinction between misinformation and disinformation, because disinformation is intentionally and maliciously placed, and it's absolutely part uh, of information warfare strategy that's happening around in the world. There are malicious actors connected to extremist movements and race narratives and gender superiority narratives, all kinds of things that are circulating. <clears throat> but it's also important to realize that um, misinformation, for all we know, can hurt just as many people as disinformation. It's, uh, for some, it's scary to think that way because we like to often think that disinformation is more serious and misinformation is less serious. But the thing is, if you still have harm at the end of both of these, uh, then it doesn't really matter there, uh, whether there was intention or not. So we can see in local context how misinformation has been playing out around the world in terms of regional disputes over who's going to get the vaccine first and who needs to wait. Uh, you're seeing it in terms of disputes about which is more important, being able to get food and shelter or being, <laughs> being alive to have those things. So when you're in that environment, people are really fatigued and it's hard for them to think critically because they're being pulled into a lot of different directions. This is not only about information, it's about their living environment and the experience of the crisis. So really, you know, we couldn't cook up a more perfect recipe uh, for uh, misinformation to spread and actually for um, having a diversity of behaviors in society. It has also been a perfect recipe for straining the health system and the relationship between people and the health system. And it's really strained also uh, people's trust into institutions, uh, into expertise, into evidence, and in some cases, trust in response and health authorities. So, you know, then, okay, how can we deal with this big challenge? And before I discuss how we can partner up with libraries from the public health and health system perspective, I think there are three aspects of the burden of the infodemic <coughs> that that we should uh, discuss uh, first. 
So first, um, one major challenge is that because we're now living in a digitally connected world, information is produced, exchanged, and consumed much faster. I think um, information library science has studied this phenomenon for a long time. And for today in our conversation, we don't need to discuss this in detail. Uh, but we do, do need to keep in mind that this high level point uh, that, that information overflow is not new. When I think back to the creation of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee, and this was 32 years ago. So we have 32 years of people producing and sharing any kinds of content without any kind of control. And internet platforms have also changed in the meantime. Uh, so at, at its creation, the internet was to be the most democratic place on earth. And the idea of the web is actually chaotic by definition. But now we find ourselves 32 years later as a society in a time when we're trying to put in rules. <coughs> but I'd say that we must be patient and stop and learn and introduce tools and policies that coexist with the infodemic. So how do we think through the content producers, content consumers, and those that are in the middle, kind of like the content mediators? So we need to not try to control or eliminate the infodemic because that will not be possible and we would fail if we tried. But at least that is how the information ecosystem evol is evolving and it's changing our lives. And because this is staying with us forever, we need to work on early education. And this was mentioned at the, at the previous panel. I agree. Um, I take a lot of inspiration for, from, for example, the fight against non-communicable diseases. It's an extremely complex challenge, health and well-being challenge to our societies as well. So colleagues that do health promotion, for example, when they talk about healthy foods and healthy lifestyles that are part of primary education in schools, we need to also think about primary education in schools and other spaces about information access and evidence. And we need to teach people how to search, how to assess quality of information they receive, and that they are aware of the cognitive shortcuts that the human brain makes when processing information. So that then later in their professional lives and through all stages of their lives, they will understand how to deal with false information and the overabundance uh, of, of information. For the second point, <coughs> let's think about what health information has meant to people. So outside of emergencies or acute health events, health information is in the back of people's minds. So before an emergency, we mostly receive health information and recommendations through our healthcare provider or doing health uh, prevention promotion activities. Outside emergencies, humans are often passive consumers of health information. But during an emergency, health information has become a valued personally. It's relevant to people because it matters to them and their families. So people actively seek health information, but also try to navigate this overabundance of information through others that they trust. And this means that people have sort of a heightened receptivity for health related information. And that also means heightened vulnerability if this is not um, enabled. Um, uh, in, in an enabling environment. So <clears throat> on the other hand, we also have an increase in generation of health information from a variety of sources. Many more people are writing or talking about health information and evidence than they did before. So there's this tension between wanting to answer questions immediately and the fact that science is iterative and it takes time. And again, it's not something that I need to explain to you, I think, but uh, you know, as an illustration, uh, there's been a huge increase in rapid publishing of COVID-19 related papers. There are challenges with the way that that research is produced, the way that it's curated and the way that it's communicated. Um, there's challenges, for example, you know, before scientists have historically not had to explain to the public how science works or how people <coughs> change their minds. Uh, when there's new research or new evidence available. But now scientific process is visible to everyone. So when you add here also that there are many different and new communication channels and many people talking who are not experts, well, that's then creating potential confusion, conflicting messages, conflicting opinions around what information is real and what can be trusted. So 
this is not just a challenge for people in communities or in vulnerable groups. It's also a challenge for health professionals, for health science students, uh, for, for anyone working in, in public health and health systems. And there is also another nuance here that I'd like to discuss. Sometimes the challenge is literally people's access to reliable information uh, on what are actually the recommended protective behaviors that people should do. So those groups and communities that tend to be less connected to the health system, that also have higher risk of uh, unfavorable health outcomes, those also tend to be the ones that have less access to reliable health information. And this may be because of language barriers or health literacy, or merely just uh, not having uh, that many ways to receive information about health. And I see access to health information as the absolute foundation to even start talking and discussing health guidance with patients and populations. So health information equity is an important part of health equity. And this is a, really a fact uh, that we need to think really out of the box how we take the opportunity of when we interact with communities, populations, and, and individuals. And then the third aspect um, that we need to keep in mind is that actually it is the people that are in the eye of the, of the infodemic and pandemic, the individuals. Um, and that's the third aspect of the infodemic that really um, who we need to focus on is the humans in this story. People are in the eye of the infodemic and the pandemic. So what is actually the way out of the pandemic? I mentioned er earlier, it's through collective action. So when, when enough people enact behaviors that protect the whole population. And this is what we're asking people to do. We're asking people to get vaccinated. We're asking people uh, to physically distance or wash hands. We're asking them to face economic hardship, uh, face stress in the family as we're trying to manage the pandemic. But then in times of hardship and uncertainty, the human mind seeks certainty and simplicity in this storm. Humans, well, uh, we tend to interpret what we experience within the frame of what we already know. So this is called confirmation bias. And in uncertain times, the self-preservation instincts of the human mind kick in. People go back to thinking patterns and habits that they know. And especially in uncertainty, people judge health topics through the lens of their worldview. And so there is less opportunity for deliberate open discussion or thinking. Or another example, uh, a patient with autoimmune disease may have had a very difficult time going through the health system. It was difficult for, uh, for them trying to get diagnosed and treated. They feel that the health system just didn't help them, that they were failed by the health system. And they had to struggle to take care of themselves and of their health. So this person takes pride that they were able to take control of their health and their body, uh, but there is very little step between this pride of having control over your own health and body to thinking that I know what's best for my health and I don't need vaccines or medicines to help myself. I'm already, I'm already helping my body. So every person deserves not only to receive access to health information, we need to create an enabling environment for people to discuss health information and discuss the choices that they have to protect themselves and their families. And then we need to support them on this journey to enact health behaviors. Uh, this, another reason, this is another reason why working with individuals, communities, and vulnerable, vulnerable groups is really important. So supporting health behaviors requires really a thoughtful, human-centered approach to understand what an individual's experience has been like and how to work with them to enact health behaviors. Now, this brings me to reflections on how public health and the health system could partner better with libraries and librarians to promote health behaviors. And <laughs> before I continue, I just want to say that when researching this talk, I came across a significant treasure trove of librarian humor memes online. Uh, I, I really enjoyed them and I hope that you will excuse me, but I will continue my talk with the help of the language of librarians that I found on the internet. So um, uh, we really do need to um, 
reflect on how the pandemic has affected libraries and their connection with communities and people. The pandemic changed how people are searching for information. So how has the pandemic also changed the library relationship with the customers? I see conversations taking place through uh, EFLA and other networks where libraries are trying to reestablish these social connections that are, in my opinion, at the core <coughs> of many services and interactions between library customers and librarians and libraries. So perhaps there are ways that we can leverage these dynamics in the society where the pandemic has moved a lot of us more online and also the libraries. Maybe there's new opportunities. And really everyone knows that librarians have superpowers, but now in COVID-19 pandemic times, everyone knows this more. This is because we've needed you more to help us search and curate and make sense uh, and communicate current evidence, as well as uh, use it to make evidence-based decisions on epidemic control measures and treatments and vaccines. So um, my full appreciation to, um, to all of your community and hard work that you're doing. So what are the superpowers that I see? First, I think libraries are trusted community places that connect people. And I think this physical or digital library space uh, they haven't not yet received enough recognition for the impact that they're making in the communities. So therefore the impact that they could make to promote access to information and resilience. So uh, I don't need to tell you, libraries can do many things, educate, build literacy, be trusted places for people to get vaccinated even, receive other health and social services. They can be used to help people find jobs, <coughs> early childhood education, help newcomers learn the local language. Um, because the infodemic dynamic plays out at individual level, it, having trusted spaces to search for and discuss health information, it's really critical. And uh, this was, trust was mentioned at the previous panel as well. It's important in supporting health behaviors because when, uh, just an example, when people that you trust share misinformation or low quality information with you, this adds credibility to it. And we let our guard down around family, friends, and colleagues. So often COVID-19 outbreaks occur in clusters because people let their guard down. Well, in the same way, uh, then the way that we practice hand uh, and cough hygiene, we should be practicing information hygiene. And I think libraries are trusted spaces for finding health information, but also for discussing this information hygiene information and media literacy skills and, and individual people with communities. And I know this was all mentioned before. Um, um, and um, we, can, we can discuss this in more detail later. Now, we've also seen that the pandemic has eroded public trust in experts. And this I think is partly because COVID-19 is such a fast moving area in which understanding is constantly changing. Um, uh, so I mentioned this before, uh, the scientific process is now visible for all this abundance of new communication channels, et cetera, is really creating uh, a challenge for us. But I see libraries play an important role in trying to be this buffer between the infodemic and people that they're serving. Uh, the curation role for information and evidence is not to be underestimated here. And I, I love... Um, what one of the previous speakers said that libraries should be information hub for people. I totally agree. Uh, I would really always want a human, a librarian to curate my personal information feed over an algorithm any day. We all should be mindful of our responsibility to science and evidence, but also of our accountability to the public on the way that science and scientific process are communicated and explained. So, um, uh, there is a role to play here for the scientific community and research journals. Um, and there's been also calls for more involvement of science communicators. But I see here also a special role for librarians with specialist backgrounds who work in settings like schools or medical libraries, who can offer infodemic management resources appropriate to their audiences. So promoting open science and good practices for evidence appraisal are critical. And I've heard all of this echoed throughout today. Uh, so this interfaces between libraries and people is the important trusted relationship for health education and promotion of all literacies. 
<coughs> information literacy, media literacy, digital literacy, health literacy. Well, we also need to realize that every one of us has a role to play in changing the health behavior of the population. It really actually does start with an individual. Each interaction that people have with the health system or with health information will give people an experience they will remember. So in many ways, libraries are an extension of the health system where information can be safely discussed. And poor information, actually, just as a note, I think nowadays is responsible for poorer health and well-being across the world. In this sense, I see libraries and librarians as uh, trusted spaces and a trusted profession, present in communities that just like community health workers, pharmacists, um, uh, can be a major ally and partner in building longer term resilience to the infodemic and to help communicate science. Now, looking back to my own experience with librarians over the course of my life, I think there is actually one other superpower that librarians have. <coughs> when people um, uh, come to the library to search for information that they need and want, librarians don't merely just provide search guidance and information. This is actually an opportunity to engage in an empathic conversation with people. For example, uh, and we do this in the health system all the time. Uh, imagine a patient researching an unproven treatment for COVID-19 or trying to make sense of information uh, on, on their medical condition. Uh, so in the same way that a, that a health professional uh, needs to learn and uh, learn the skills and have the resources to have this conversation with their patients, well, I think librarians can leverage the trust that patients and customers place in you by encouraging open and empathic conversation about topics that might cause worry or anxiety and concern. And I'd suggest here that we shouldn't underestimate how powerful this can be. Uh, if one just makes an environment where people can ask questions about what they're searching without being judged and be ready to link them to other resources or people as needed. This would be really uh, key. Now, I've been trained in information science and informatics. And I also think that uh, a way to respond to the infodemic is to work on tools that will help us faster identify what information we're searching for. And also tools that help us quickly review and improve how we are tagging and annotating content that we produce so that it is more discoverable and analyzable. Um, Health authorities, uh, their websites really are not discoverable on the internet. Uh, there's lots that I think uh, both information uh, uh, scientists, but also librarians could contribute in multidisciplinary teams so that they could problem solve in the space of information management and knowledge management in health. And also in the conversations when we imagine what a healthier information ecosystem in general uh, may look like. And then lastly, I think that the librarian superpower is also the power of networks. Uh, not only are the libraries uh, deeply connected into various communities, you're also connected to each other through your networks. And this is a superpower in a world where we're trying to imagine how do we coexist in this world of mass digitalized information and evidence. Networks help you exchange experience and learn from one another. But I also think that your networks are also a critical search capacity for us in the health system to help respond with high quality information to localized crisis in community or even to the next pandemic. So I'd like you then actually leave you with a question. Um, what can we in the health system and the public health do better to partner up with you and to help you so that we can address the infodemic together? The infodemic is sticking around and so are the humans. So as you reflect on how evidence and information sharing and the working environment is changing for your profession, for uh, your workplace, please also think how we can work together to build evidence and information literacy and resilient communities now so that we are ready before the next uh, emergency. And uh, we are certainly advocating for novel partnerships through all of the interfaces where are, that are trusted spaces between uh, health, health topics, health system, 
health information and communities and individuals. And I see libraries as a, as a very critical uh, partner uh, in this. So I would like to conclude here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tina, for that very engaging, thoughtful, and I think future-oriented uh, presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. So the first is, what tool or method would you suggest based on your research and experience to the public for assessing health information that's found online? Hmm. There are several really good, uh, uh, very short toolkits, um, and, and actually, um, actually, not several, many, uh, but uh, we published some, but also fact-checking organizations, uh, uh, also libraries have produced toolkits. Uh, what's really important when we speak with, uh, or when we provide resources to the public, that it's uh, very, uh, very clear uh, and very short. So. Uh, when we talk about information hygiene, or at least, you know, uh, stop before you share, pause, assess, uh, really having uh, very, very um, pointed steps uh, would be important. So if you look on our website, um, the steps would be look at, uh, look at the source, um, look who shared it with you, uh, et cetera, and really pause, uh, verify before you share. Um, these are very small, uh, small actions that we can take but just to point out that uh, this is very critical at the time of a crisis where the internet is amplifying and we as humans are amplifying all kinds of information online. But we do need to also look at more systemic or more systematic way of working with people, uh, engaging with them. Because right now, when we are asking people to have the, their sole responsibility on deciding whether they share information or not, we're putting all the responsibility on the person, but actually it's our own responsibility as a community, as a society, and in, in our exchanges, it's, it's equal responsibility, not just every individual one. So you talked a little bit about um, working collaboratively. And so in your experience, what are the benefits of a cross-disciplinary approach to managing mm -hmm. information, particularly during times of high uncertainties, such as the pandemic or other emergency situations? <laughs> Um, it comes down to how well uh, can you actually uh, work together and innovate uh, and anticipate what the actual needs of, of people are. So who you're actually designing either an intervention or a product or a service or, or something for, right? And multidisciplinarity brings uh, the critical human centeredness. Uh, it literally breaks the barriers uh, across uh, not just not just uh, ac um, academic disciplines, but also professions. It's really important to keep keep that in mind, because um, that is actually also uh, necessary to open all of our human minds to creativity. If we challenge each other from very different perspectives without judgments, uh, this actually means we can enable each other to leapfrog much faster in innovation and what we do compared to uh, you know, keeping uh, in, uh, in, in your own set uh, uh, lane, uh, for example. Great. So you mentioned um, that both misinformation and disinformation can be harmful. And so you talked a little bit about um, literacies and we've talked a lot about health literacy today, information mm -hmm. literacy. So beyond that, what other literacies do you think it's important to focus on at either an individual or population level? Yeah. You know, um, you're 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 absolutely right. I think one of the speakers uh, was saying there's so many, and we're we keep discovering concepts that should be a part of the of this. Um, I'm you know I'm a pragmatist because I'm a I, I'm a practitioner of public health, so I always think, okay, well, what do we practically need? And if we are trying to encourage and create safe environment for enabling health behaviors, then we need to think, well, what is actually right now. Um, uh, influencing a lot of our behaviors. And you've mentioned uh, several, but those that we haven't yet picked up, but are extremely important is, well, uh, how are we digitally literate? Uh, are we able, is a person able, for example, to translate the benefit of having access to technology and being able to use it? Can they translate it into a better health outcome for themselves? That's a very, very nuanced thing. And another thing, for example, another example is uh, 
interaction uh, among people online, uh, how we build identities and how we express each other. Uh, internet fluency, uh, language of memes, uh, language of interaction that is not in words is something that perhaps younger generations that have grown up with this digitalized uh, society are more fluent in, but actually, uh, and that, that does make a very huge difference in not just how we engage with them, but also uh, how the internet works for the different people that have different type of self-efficacy here. So um, in addition to the, all the traditional literacies that one would think about, I would really challenge that we need to be uh, a bit forward reaching on what is changing society and people and how we function. And we haven't put enough attention to the nuances that are that technology has changed our lives and, and how we think and work. Great. Well, kind of parallel to that, um, and, and given your background in AI, what applications do you see for technology such as AI and kind of helping to manage these issues around misinformation and disinformation going forward, particularly as it relates to healthcare and health information? That, that's uh, extremely multifaceted. Um, if we just focus only on, on the infodemic, I'll just give a couple of examples, but even if we look at the very uh, basic, you know, the, the three aspects on, on information ecosystem, uh, content producers, content consumers, and people or those that are mediating uh, this, um, those that are producing content should actually have tools available to understand what are the actual needs for content? Are we producing content just because we think people need it and it would be great? Or are we actually changing our paradigm of our own behavior and thinking we should be focusing our academic work, we should be focusing our health promotion work, our communication work on things that people actually are seeking for. So we need tools that will allow us to identify what are the questions, what are people searching for more in real time in my opinion. And then on the, um, uh, on the content consumer side, uh, many things that perhaps could help us uh, interact um, and, and, and sort of um, get an overview of, of, of evidence or information faster. Although I'm absolutely not uh, an advocate that AI and technology should replace this filtering bubble. Uh, I really do think that humans uh, our, uh, AI can help us sift through and read through a lot of information. Uh, for example, my colleagues in the Pan American Health Organization, uh, they did a study of just on, on, on papers that were published about Zika, uh, about chikungunya uh, in, in the last 10 years, and it would take one person 50 years to read all of the evidence. So technology can actually help us uh, identify information uh, a lot, but we need uh, that human human interaction, not just to appraise it, but then also translate it and convey it to uh, other people in an effective way. And that human uh, human connection is really important uh, uh, there. Uh, and then of course, in the content mediation uh, piece, I do think that technologies uh, should help us also appraise the black boxes of the algorithms that are currently implemented. Uh, I, but I think actually we need to strive for transparency and really imagine what a healthier, like I said, a healthier information ecosystem would look like. Technology can help us if we, if we govern it uh, from, from the lens of, of serving humans and uh, first, yeah. And so last question, um, with the community that you're talking to today, librarians, health communication professionals, a very interdisciplinary group, if there was one small step, one small change to implement tomorrow, uh, what would you advocate for in terms of um, moving the conversation forward and, and starting to initiate some of the, mm. the change? That you're calling for? And I have two. <laughs> Two, two is perfect. So, um, so absolutely the key message, and I agree again with the panel that I heard before, um, we need to embrace human centeredness. And that also means participatory methods, not just in research, but anything that we do. Because if the participatory uh, engagement is done well, it changes both the person that is both, both, both uh, sides uh, that are engaging. And that's actually how we, how we effectively uh, feel information. 
But then, you know, the, the last key message uh, that I had when I was when I was listening to Shinad, Shinad um, uh, summarizing last panel is um, I think um, I would challenge your whole community, engage with the health policymakers and make libraries a policy uh, partner and, uh, and a delivery, uh, uh, sort of like a, a delivery vehicle for interventions of any kind because uh, this is absolutely what we're through infodemic management advocating for. But I really think that uh, what would uh, make libraries the information hubs uh, would also need to be thought through, not on only the individual level, et cetera, and from the science, and, uh, but really from policy and uh, really reimagine also how this policy uh, can actually help um, um, uh, help actually build uh, together with you um, uh, the role of libraries the way that you would also want them to 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 be. Okay. Well, on that note, Ms. Tina Cornett, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was a wonderful uh, presentation, and we're so glad that you could be with us. Thank you for everybody who participated today, all of our presenters earlier in the day, everybody who attended. Um, we will be working on getting the keynotes and panel sessions up on our YouTube channel next week. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and thank you, Tina. Thank you.